Man, you guys are asleep already. You must have just had a bunch of donuts. Good morning. Good morning. That's better. Jeez. You know, if you guys aren't having fun, there's something seriously wrong with this situation. So please have some fun today. My name is Jason Yoder. Welcome to Accelerated Constrained Endpoint Deployment. In other words, how to keep your interns from doing bad things. Who's had an intern before? A few of you. Who's had an intern who's done something bad? Yeah. You know, what's really fun about interns when they come into your office, they're like, oh, yeah, I'm in college. I'm great. You know, when they come skipping in, it's a good day. But what happens when they do this? Clear your schedule for the rest of the day. It is going to take that long. Let me tell you guys a little bit about myself again. My name is Jason Yoder. I'm actually a Microsoft certified trainer, which means I'm a nerd with at least one social skill. That's your requirement to be an MCT. I actually specialize in delivering training in Windows PowerShell, but I also do the Windows Server and Climate. What? Oh, Cortana! I know you didn't get that. That's nothing new. Wait a second. Hang on. Hang on. Let me turn the volume on here. Let's see. Hey, Cortana, who's your daddy? Technically speaking, that'd be Bill Gates. No big deal. Like I said, if I'm not having fun, something's seriously wrong here. Let's try that again. No, really, guys, uh, my degree is in computer science, but by trade, I'm the network administrator. So really leveraging PowerShell is pretty easy for me because I've got a really good idea where we need to do some automation. But I've also had a very, let's just say, varied career as well. I'm also a chief petty officer in the United States Navy. My rating is information systems technician. So I'm a nerd in the civilian world, and I'm a nerd... In the military world, what we're going to be doing is discussing some security today. And actually, my current duty in the, in the Navy is to teach Security Plus. Why? Because we have security issues. All right, we need to resolve these. We're going to talk about our goal, a little bit about our goal today, which is, of course, to stop Timmy from doing bad things to us. And then I'm going to show you how to deploy endpoints, some of the problems we have with deploying these constrained endpoints, and how to get around them. And then, of course, the big thing, how do we make sure we stick to what's called the principle of least privilege? What is the principle of least privilege? That's right. Have you noticed that if your users discover that they have more rights than what they should, they spend a lot of time using those extra rights and not actually doing their job? Yeah, they do that. Okay, so... Let's talk about a few areas where I've been breached in security because the users had excessive rights. Now, this one goes a long ways back, but I think you all enjoy this one. Anybody remember a little operating system called Windows 98? Yeah, a long time ago, right? I did not want to deploy this. This was at a public school system. All right, so I actually wanted to deploy Windows NT. It'd be secure, right? But it was $100 a seat more. I, they kind of said no do this. <laughs> um, so one day while I'm doing a normal check of my network, I noticed a sixth grader in a room full of computers without an instructor all by themselves. So I fired up system center, brought up the uh, screen and I'm watching the sixth grader. So the sixth grader opens my cache credentials and copies all the contents, goes to the teacher's cache credentials, paste my contents, logs off as a sixth grader, logs in as the teacher, and now the teacher has my admin rights. Cool, huh? Yeah, don't deploy unsecure operating systems no matter what management says. All right, how about this one? Anybody have a terminated user who still had access? You guys are very fortunate, okay. No, this is bad because I'm not kidding you. I, this is my first week at a you know, large engineering company in Indianapolis. And when I inherit somebody else's network, you know what it's like. You kind of have to figure out what's going on under the hood. So I open the security logs, and I happen to hear by the water cooler, somebody got fired on Friday. I'm looking at Saturday, and I can see an interactive login inside the building. They didn't even take his keys. All right. How about this one? Who has an FTP server? Yeah, so... Here's the thing, unfortunately, being in the military, sometimes I have to go away for a while, which means I have to trust people. Right. So I come back, and someone gives me a call, and they say, hey, Jason, you might want to look at your FTP server. Okay. So I look at it. 
we're an adult pornography distribution center. <laughs> Speaking of which, sound, recording, disabled. Bye-bye, Cortana. I love you, sweetheart, but not right now. Okay, yes, we are an adult industry distribution site. Boy, I was happy not. All right, but we also have this one. Our college intern, you know, I want them to be able to do things. But when I gave cer uh, certain intern rights, let's just say I was still pretty inexperienced at the time. Oops. Yeah, it's called backup tape time. All right, so we're going to take a look at some ways. You know what? She did not have me do this. I have extra time. I feel like that I'm going to kill Dorothy if this goes all the way down. And I feel like we're in the Wizard of Oz. Gotcha. All right, so <laughs> let's talk a little bit here. First of all, Gia. Who's heard of Gia? You better raise your hands by now. Good. This is not for you. Seriously, I'm not going to do Gia. Gia is awesome. But you guys remember, I'm an MCT. I just taught my 79th PowerShell class before flying over here. I know what's in the industry. A lot of people don't have PowerShell 5 yet. All right, so what we're going to talk a little bit about today is how to get some of the benefits of GIA in an environment where we cannot have GIA. And that, let me tell you, that exists out there. I remember when I tried to convince the superintendent we need to upgrade to the next version of Windows. This is kind of how it went. You're my guinea pig. Jason? Just because Bill Gates releases a new operating system doesn't mean we're going to pay for it. Okay, so I get a lot of that in the industry. I also get a lot that, hey, we don't have the funds or the time or the people to upgrade to the cutting edge. So we have to work with what we have, right? It's okay. We have ways to work with this. We're going to maintain the principle of least privilege and prevent overcomplication. See, that's my whole thing. Anybody work with somebody who likes to take the most complex process? You're kidding me. Oh, wow. I tell you what, I'm, I'm jealous of you guys. I've worked with people who deliberately made it as complex as possible to show off. And as a result, I went home on Friday at 5 p.m. and they worked the weekend. All right? So we're going to try and prevent this. But let's also keep our intern, Timmy, from doing bad things. Now, a few things on GIA. One of the problems we have with our uh, endpoints is how we actually create them out there. So the thing is, GIA actually helps us solve this, but we need to use DSC as the recommended way of deploying all that stuff out there. Who has DSC running in their entire environment? Right. Oh, show off. <laughs> right. Okay, so when I'm talking to people about this, now granted, I helped develop Microsoft's training, the official training on PowerShell, and I've been keeping it up to date. It's actually based on PowerShell 3, which is the basis even for PowerShell 6. All right, but when I talk to talk about GIA and DSC, people go, Jason, we just can't do this right now. It's going to be years. Okay. Well, first of all, PowerShell 5 is one of our requirements for GIA. And, well, you can go all the way back to Windows 7. Good luck if you're still on it. Um, but, you know, again, that requires you to do some updates, and that takes testing. So we kind of have to watch out. So here's our issues. Not everybody can have PowerShell 5. And also, we potentially have hundreds, if not thousands, of physical and virtual machines already deployed. People aren't going to undeploy a system just so they can play with DSC. So let's play around with some code here, guys. And by the way, if anybody feels, whoops, probably helps I change screens. If anybody thinks they need to start taking notes at the end of this presentation, I'll give you the link that you can all take a picture of to download every piece of code you're about to see. All right? That's how I run my PowerShell classes, because if not, people... Oh, what did he just do there? Now, I mean, I think there's like 600 some lines of code. And you're not going to get it all. First of all, guys, remember when Jeffrey was talking yesterday about, about running uh, PowerShell code in a virtual machine, even though you're not in it? Here's actually how you do it, because I have none of my files loaded up. By the way, don't ever store a password in a script. It's bad. I do this for demonstration purposes only. All right, so I'm going to get the domain admin administrator's account for my VMs. I've got a couple of files that I need to relocate over there. And when you run invoke command, VM name is what it's called. That's how you use PowerShell Direct. Now, mind you, I'm on a, a Windows 10 machine. That's a server 2016 VM. That's why it works. 
So let me just go ahead and copy that stuff over real quick. And now, when I go over to my domain controller, let's go ahead and load up the code. All the files are over there. Okay, now we can start playing. Let's set up our scenario. We just hired Timmy. So let's go ahead and create a new account. Once again, please do not put a password inside your code. It's considered bad. Now, the thing is, is I like to practice role-based management. That's where I'm not going to give access rights to a user account. I'm going to give it to a group. Kind of makes things a little easier. I can just add that user to a new group. They get the new access rights. So we're going to create a group called Help Desk Members because Timmy is going to be part of my help desk. And I'm going to go ahead and add Timmy into that. Okay. So now that Timmy's part of our organization, let's see how Timmy is able to utilize PowerShell. First of all, our endpoints. Now, these are what are registered with PowerShell on all of our machines. Now, being a domain controller or a machine with remote server administrator tools installed, this is how server manager talks to all the other server managers in your system. It goes through PowerShell in the background. If you're using a 32-bit version of PowerShell, why? If you are, there is a 32-bit version. If you're using work workflows, is anybody using workflows? That's the usual response. We have maybe 2% of us. Okay, good job for you. But the top one up there, Microsoft.PowerShell, that is the default connection that we will authenticate to unless we tell it otherwise. I'd like to clarify that because some of the stuff we're going to do today. Let's go ahead and test this out. By the way, this environment, we have a domain controller um, and two servers running 2016 and a third, uh, fourth third server, excuse me, that's running Windows Server 2012 R2 and PowerShell 4. So let's go ahead and just see where we're at. We're on the domain controller. We're going to do a one-to-one -one remote session. Again, we're just making sure everything's working here. I can see I'm on server one, so I'm going to come back to the domain controller. And again, that is the default configuration endpoint. There's some rules on who can use it. We'll take a look at those rules and why we're not going to let Timmy use it. Just to show you, if you need to connect to one of those other endpoints, you have to use the configuration name parameter, and you can connect in. All right, so let's play around just a little bit here. Uh, first of all, I want to bring up a help file for one of the commandlets that we're going to be using. It's called new PS session configuration file. This helps us to define um, settings for this new connection particularly what the person can do. And the reason I'm going to bring this one up is I kind of want to scroll down here. Now, I'm on a PowerShell 5 machine here. And the updated version of this command has a couple parameters that help us when it comes to GIA. For example, role definitions, run as vir virtual accounts. That allows a temporary account to be generated for this user without granting them admin rights. But if we jump over here, I'm going to pull the help file from our Windows, excuse me, our PowerShell 4 machine. I did not update the help file, so I can quickly go through the parameters here. And you're not going to find those there, so it's not available. That's one of the requirements of GIA. So we're in an environment here where we can't exactly use it. That's okay. We're going to give it some capabilities. What we're going to do first is we're going to create a base template that we're going to use to deploy our endpoints out there. And at the same time, I'm going to show you one of the issues. So first of all, I'm going to create a little directory. Oh, it's already there. A directory called PS. I like creating it because that's the one I delete and cleans up my mess when I'm done. I'm going to create a new definition of an endpoint under what's called a restricted remote server. Basically, you're not going to be able to do anything with this. And that's one of the ideas. We're going to take it all the way down to the bare bones and start giving back what we want that person to be able to use. If we take a look at that file inside of Notepad, There's not a whole lot in here. Really, the only thing that we have not have that's not coming out is that we have a session type that is restricted. That's what we want. So, first of all, let's enter server one, a 2016 server using the default endpoint, and I'm going to run get command. Now, if I were to allow Timmy to use this endpoint, let's see how many remove and unregisters can Timmy do. 199. How many modifications? 300. How many creations? 141. Mind you, this server does nothing. There is no additional PowerShell modules. But that's a lot of damage Timmy could perform if we allowed Timmy 
to enter this. Let's jump back to the domain controller. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and create that new endpoint. We have a definition file. We need to register it. We're going to call this help desk. Remember, Microsoft.PowerShell is our default. We're going to call this one help desk. This is where I want my help desk people to connect to. And I'm going to use a parameter called show security descriptor user interface, or use I. And this starts to hint at the first problem. A GUI pops up. Aren't we supposed to be moving away from the GUI? Now, I'm not going to lie. I'll be honest with you. People ask me some questions. PowerShell is not always the best answer. All right? If you guys uh, come to one of my presentations tomorrow, you'll see me temporarily pop up a GUI to create a group policy because it's faster that way. But we're going to go ahead and finish this off. I'm going to add in my help desk members. Again, that's my security group. And I need to make sure I tell them that they can execute. Now, everything's all fine and dandy. Let's take a look at the configuration endpoints here. And you can see the help desk is now listed. All right. Let's test things out. First of all, I'm going to get a credential object for Timmy so that we can test with Timmy's account. So let's go ahead and grab it. I'm going to authenticate. And it stores Timmy's credential object in my variable called credential. Let's attempt to remote into this new endpoint, or excuse me, into the default endpoint as Timmy. And that's what happens. Timmy's not allowed. Remember, this is not the one we just created. Let's remote in as Timmy to the one we created, and we have success. If I run get command, that's all Timmy can do, at least for now. Now, remember, part of our job is to make sure that our users have the, or our help desk people, have the ability to do what they need to do. I would say right now, Timmy is probably going to be staying in, in on his desk, playing video games on his phone, because he, he can't do a whole lot right now, right? All right, we need to fix this without causing a lot of damage to our system. So let's jump back to the domain controller and see why Timmy cannot get to the default endpoint. This is part of the built-in security, the operating system, domain admins, remote management users. They're the only ones who are allowed to connect to it. So, of course, our, our strategy is to give Timmy domain admin rights, right? I'm glad everybody says no. I'm not kidding you guys. Sometimes in my Windows Server classes, oh, yeah, yeah, that's what we do. Good luck with that. Okay, let's take a look at the permissions on the help desk one. And what I want to show you right here is, there it is, domain help desk members. They are allowed access to the same point. That's why Timmy could get in. Here's the real reason why. I'm going to pull up the security descriptor SDDL property. Oh, that's descriptive now, isn't it? You know, when I show this, people ask me, why do they make this so complicated? If they spelled this all out in English or any other language, it would go to about this big. All right, that's why we have this complex code. Um, let's take a look at something here. I see that there is a security identifier right here. And I see it has a relative identifier of one, excuse me, 2112. I'm going to pull up the SID of the help desk members security group, and you're going to see it matches that. So at least we're able to decipher some of that just a little bit, right? At least we know that that SID's included in there. All right, well, let's play around a little bit here, and let's see if we can deploy our endpoint out there. And this is where we're going to highlight one of the problems we're going to overcome. I'm going to go ahead and create a session to server one. Again, this is a 2016 server we're using here. Uh, let's take a look at its endpoints before we do anything. We can see the four default endpoints are currently present. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and create our configuration file. I'm not doing anything different than what I did locally on this machine. And now I'm going to create its help desk endpoint. I'm going to register it. And you can see we're using so security descriptor UI. And we're going nowhere. What just happened? There you go. Guys, this is PowerShell remoting. We don't have the GUI. If you want the GUI, you've got to go to an RDP connection. If we go to an RDP connection, did this process just not go manual? All right, that's kind of against the whole way I work. Anybody here like doing manual? Good, you're in the right conference. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, break out of this because we're going to go nowhere on this particular one. 
So, again, that security string we need to bring over there. Well, let me see something here. What does all this mean? Because now you guys have to come up with this on your own, don't you? What's this, GXGR? Well, I don't know. Let's take a look at some document. Oh, look, MSDN. Isn't that our favorite place to go? Let me see here. Yeah. Now, of course, these websites are built into the code for you guys. Um, is there any GXGRs in this one? No, actually, I think it's an access control entry. Let's try that. What does that stuff mean? You see how this can come very cumbersome if we have to go through the... Oh, there's GX is general or genetic, generic execute. GR is generic read. Oh, isn't that those properties we just gave it in the GUI a few minutes ago? Yeah. So here's the thing. If you want to do this, you have to figure out how to type that string. Okay. Session's over. Questions? Uh, no, I'm not going to do that to you. All right. So let's figure out how we can fix this problem. First of all, we created a template, right? That was that endpoint we created here locally. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to capture just that security string. In a variable, we're going to call SDDL. All right, there it is. We've got it. Now, what I'm going to do is let's try to repeat that procedure on the remote server, but this time without the GUI interface. So we create our file, our definition. And now I'm going to go ahead, instead of using the parameter called show security SDDL, I'm going to use the parameter show uh, security descriptor SDDL. And I'm passing it from my machine the SDDL variable. Who's not familiar with the using scope? Okay, so what happens is this in PowerShell 2, in order for me to send information from my machine, memory, variables, what have you, from my machine over there, I would have to add the argument list parameter of invoke command, and then inside the script block, I would have to declare a parameter statement to create memory to receive it. With PowerShell 3, and I'm surprised this is actually in very few books. In PowerShell 3, we have something called using scope. What that means is this. When PowerShell sees it, it automatically takes the, in my case, SDDL variable from my machine, creates it on the remote machine, and assigns it the value. So it kind of cuts down on coding a little bit. PowerShell 3 is your requirement for that one. So let's go ahead and run this code. We're going to register. We're going to call it help desk 2. Looks like it went through OK. Let's take a look at the endpoints that are currently on server one. I can see help desk two is now out there. Let's take a look at its security descriptors. Looks familiar. Whoops, let's confirm it. Hey, they happen to match. I think we might actually have something that's going to work here without us having to manually go to each machine. Let's play around and see what Timmy's able to do. I'm going to go ahead and enter that particular remote session, let's run some commands that should not work. I mean, get process. Come on. How dangerous is this, right? It's not going to work. Get date. Nope. Get service. Not happening. Get command. Okay. We got those. So what we now have is the ability for me to set, create an endpoint on a lot of remote machines without actually bringing up the GUI to do it. So if anybody wants to calculate your time savings on that, it's a lot of time. How many of you have more than one server? <laughs> I figured that. Okay, how about this one? How many have more than one client out there that you want your help desk to get access to? Yeah, exactly. All right, so that problem's been solved, but Timmy still can't do anything. In some cases, that's good. So let's go ahead and take a look here at the commandlets Timmy has available to him. Just those. Let's add something in here so Timmy can actually run some PowerShell. By the way, in a restricted remote session, you're not going to have tab completion. You're not going to have comparison operators. So you see how this really cuts down the damage somebody can do. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to recreate my description file, and I'm going to use visible commandlets. With visible commandlets, you'll see there in the help file, there's several visible parameters. With visible commandlets, it allows Timmy to use just this extra commandlet. Let's go ahead and create the new definition file. Again, I'm going to do it. Everything's going to be done in remote machines here. We're going to register it this time as help desk three. I'm going to enter help desk three, and we're going to try to run an unauthorized command, get SMB share. Not happening. 
We're going to run get command to see what we can do. Ah, get process is there. And it also executes. So now we're able to deploy to remote machine, a remote service endpoints with a limited set of allowed commandlets, only two members of particular security groups. So we're starting to get things rolling here, but we probably need them to do more than just one command. So let's take a look at a few things here. I'm going to bring a few more uh, scripts into my session. And I actually need to run this one. Now, this is a really basic uh, function I created just for this presentation. And what it's going to do is it's going to take a look at all the commands currently in PowerShell. Uh, it's going to take a look at all three or four scripts I have in that directory. It's going to show me a listing of all the PowerShell commandlets that are inside there so I know what commandlets to assign Timmy. That's a lot of commandlets I probably don't want Timmy to actually use. Now, we could use this list and apply that to the visible commandlets, and then Timmy would be allowed to use them. But we don't have to. Because I can actually write scripts for Timmy to run, and Timmy cannot individually use components of that script. Let me show you. We're going to write a very basic script out on that server. Two PowerShell commandlets will be used, get date and write host. I know they're dangerous. We probably don't want Timmy using these, right? So let's go ahead and create that script on the remote machine. I'm going to go ahead and create my definition file, but you can see I'm adding another parameter. Visible external commands. That's what a script would be considered in this case. I'm going to allow Timmy to run this particular script. Let's see what happens. Registering our new endpoint with that new definition file. Let's go ahead and enter that endpoint. Here's our command. You can see get process is listed, and it runs. And so does the script. But let's go ahead and individually run the commandlets that were inside the script. Get date fails, and so does write host. So even though Timmy has those commands inside the script, Timmy can't run it. Now, I would say, yes, go ahead. Let's try it out then. Can you dot source that script? So we're in, let's see. Let's verify we're at location, get location. Okay, we're in the PS. Let's just make sure C drive access PS. No, I'm not doing very good here. Let's try this. Let's dot source, wait, dot space, C colon backslash PS backslash script one dot PS one. Man, Timmy's not going to be happy, is he? I would still, yeah, I would still consider digitally signing the script just in case. Um, I'll go ahead and skip to the end right now just because you asked that question. This is not going to be a perfect solution. Nothing is, but it is a lot better than giving Timmy admin rights, right? Yeah, so there may be ways to hack around this. I will never say there's never a way to hack around something. All right, so we now have Timmy to build, gave Timmy the ability to use some scripts. Now, this is a good thing because that means I've defined what Timmy can do both at the command line, but also what, I'm going to, what scripts I'm going to allow Timmy to run. So I know the scripts haven't been played around with, and Timmy can run off and start, I don't know, enumerating all the network drives he has access to, recursively going through all the files in that system and deleting them. Does anybody know what Timmy did to me? He did just that. All right, so we got to be careful. All right, let's take a look at that endpoint, because if you notice, for Timmy to be able to connect to that endpoint, he had to specifically say it, right? There is a way to get around that so they don't have to specifically say what endpoint. So we're going to set a default value. Now, I'm not really, personally, I'm not really big on default values, because when it comes to scripting, if you accidentally use it, your script just lost its portability. So, you know, I'm just showing this for demonstration. Use it if you like. The current variable... Um, call, or the, pair, the variable called PS session configuration name holds the default endpoint. I'm going to rename this to help desk four, which is the endpoint. Now, this would be done on Timmy's computer. If Timmy would go to a different machine, it would not be there. So, again, that's where the whole portability thing comes into play. We're going to go ahead and set that. I'm going to verify that it took. We're going to go ahead and enter a PS session without telling it where to go. I'm going to list my commands and get processes there. So it did go to our new endpoint, even though we didn't tell it where to go. 
Now, just for the sake of the rest of this demonstration and my personal sanity, I'm going to reset the default endpoint on this machine back to where it's supposed to be. Okay. So, let's take a look at how we can do this in mass now. Remember, I've got a couple of extra servers here, don't I? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new PS session to these machines. Now, I did not include code in here. For what potential problem do you see right now? What if the machine's not there? What if the machine's offline? All right, I do have to leave a little bit of work for you guys. All right, so understand that if the machine is currently not there, if you're deploying these endpoints to your client machines, you're going to need some type of code that tells you if the machine's not there so you can replay that code back later on, all right? So we have, a ses we have sessions to each one of those machines. Let's take a look at them, make sure they're all here. They're all available, so we're going to go ahead and use them. I'm going to send over a script to each one of those machines that I want Timmy to be able to utilize. Here's the script. You can see, again, it's nothing complex, but it's also going to help me highlight another problem that we're going to come across with certain commandlets. So I'm going to make sure that I have that directory I call PS on each machine so I can clean up my mess at the end of this demonstration. I'm going to copy that help, IT help desk script over to all those machines. And now I'm going to go ahead and create the configuration file on all those machines. Yes, technically, I probably should do it on my machine and just transfer it. I'm being lazy here. And then I'm going to register it. You can see the visible external command is now our new script that I want all my help desk people to use. So we're going to do the entire thing in just one command. Off it goes. We're looking pretty good. We're going to go to server two. Again, this is a 2016 server. We've entered it. Let's check our commands. Let's run something. Let's make sure the script runs. And, ooh, did this work just a few minutes ago when we told it it can run an external script? Well, it did, part of it. This is one, and I'll be honest with you, this is where one thing that I was not able to overcome in the manner that I wanted to, and it comes whenever we use WMI. Now, just to show you guys, I'm going to run get process against all three of those machines. Just to show you, the endpoints did register correctly. There's server 2, server 1, DC1. It is working. So let's figure out what's going on here. I'm going to ask for the type name of the command get process, the object type name, and it's system diagnostics process. Now remember, this is what we would search, uh, you know, um, I guess I have to say Bing here, don't I? If you're using Bing, anybody using Bing? That is the general response I get as well. So those of you who use Google, um, this is what you would search for to, to get the description of the object produced by get process, right? Well, that's a pretty easy one. That command ran. Let's take a look at get disk. Ooh, that's a little different. Let's take a look at another one. I like this one, get volume. I love this command. Yeah, we have a problem. What's going on? Any ideas? I'm sorry, I think I heard it. Sim. Yeah, it's going to the WMI library. Totally different issue we have now here. So let me tell you, I spent quite a bit of time trying to figure out a workaround on this one, and it all came back to the same issue. You essentially have to be an administrator to touch that from a remote system, which kind of causes a small problem. If I want Timmy to run any, and let me tell you, there are a lot of PowerShell commandlets starting on Windows 8 that hit the sim libraries. I have to give Timmy admin rights now, don't I? Anybody comfortable with this? You've all answered that question correctly. No hands went up. Okay, so let's play around, just see if I can work around this problem. What I'm going to do is I'm going to add a few commandlets. I'm going to add in get volume, get disk, and get sim instance. We're going to deliberately see if we can do this. I'm going to register this all as help desk 6. So let's go ahead and take a look. There we go. Let's test as an administrator. I'm going to go in under the default endpoint as the administrator, and I'm going to verify that we can get the volume information. There it goes. It works. Okay. Remember, we're an administrator, and we're using the default endpoint. Let's uh, bounce out. Let's go back into our restricted endpoint, help desk 6 as Timmy. And remember, I said Timmy can use get volume and get some instance. I think we should be covered, right? Right? 
I'm getting a little worried. I would say that's going to be a big, uh, no, not happening. So we're stuck. Don't worry, there's ways to get around this. Okay, we're going to get to that. Let's go ahead and exit the PS session and see what we can do to fix it. Now, these websites I left on here as part of my research into why we cannot get this to work. I actually went into the SIM libraries and explicitly gave that security group and Timmy the rights to access them the remotely. It still doesn't work. Yeah, so we're really running out of options. So Gia, by the way, does help to address this because of the run as virtual account. It does address this issue, and you should be able to get around it nicely. But we are working in a world right now where not everybody can use Gia. So this workaround does have a security flaw, and, of course, I'm going to tell you guys about it. I'm going to create a domain admin account for Timmy. Everybody, anybody comfortable with this? Good. Oh, bad answer. Good answer for the rest of you guys. Okay. Yeah, we don't really want to do this, but don't worry. I'm not going to give Timmy the password. How does Timmy use an account without the password? Now, of course, that does create the vulnerability that somebody needs to know the password. So it's going to have to, of course, be a trusted individual. More than likely, you're going to keep it to one individual. So there is still an accountability if this account is ever explicitly used. All right, again, this is not a perfect solution, but we can get Timmy running here. I'm going to create a help desk remote account. So I'm going to go ahead and create this. I do recommend, of course, using the official Microsoft training password for every service account you create. Nobody's going to even try this because everybody knows it's bad, right? All right, so, you know, seriously, when I teach um, Security Plus to my sailors and I tell them that, really, we can use that? Let's just say I've got great job security there, okay? All right, so I'm going to go ahead and add, dare I say, to the domain admins. Now, you don't technically need to do this part uh, as long as you add it to a group that ends up being a local administrator on the targeted machines. So we can actually use group policy, create a restricted group that forces this help desk admin security group, whatever you want to create, to become a local administrator on the targeted machines. That way, Timmy can't use this on the domain controllers, which, by the way, normally I would not have done this to a domain controller. It was just really convenient. Let's go ahead and create, did I add it in? Let me add our HDRA account into domain admins. And what I'm going to do now is, of course, get the credential for it, the credential object, because I need to register a new PS session configuration file. I'm going to go ahead and use the help desk definition that we already created. Um, but this time you can see I'm adding in another uh, parameter, run as credential. Run as virtual account would have been really nice, but we don't have that luxury right now. So we're going to run as credential, and you can see I'm passing it the help desk object. There it is. Now we're going to go ahead and enter help desk 7 as Timmy. Let's try to run our problematic command, get volume. Okay, that worked, right? Of course it worked. Timmy's an admin. We just gave him the keys to the Ferrari. Let me tell you, this kid is going to go wild on you. Not good. Get service doesn't work. I'm an admin. I can't write host. So we still have some restrictions, right? Well, truth be told, we have quite a few restrictions. Let's take a look at accountability. Anybody ever inherit somebody else's network and there is a singular enterprise admin account that the entire IT department knew about? Yeah. Who had the accountability on that one? Nobody, right? That's a huge problem. Because without accountability, when something bad happens, what are you going to do, fire the entire IT staff? <laughs> it's been tempting before, hasn't it? All right, so we really can't do that. Let's kind of test this because I'm going to have more than one person assigned to the security group. I need to know who just used that account, even though they don't have the passwords. So let's see. Uh, first of all, I'm going to jump over here to server one. It's just easier to see this in the GUI, guys. I'm going to go ahead and clear out the security log. I'm going to go ahead and remote in. Now, this is going to use our previous configuration file. Well, Timmy was not, uh, we're not using the HDRA account. We're using Timmy. Excuse me. Here we go. There it is. And I'm going to immediately exit out of this session. 
and let's see what happened in the security logs. Looking for event 4624. I know it's a little hard to read, but I can clearly see Timmy. All right, that's what we expected. Now I'm going to clear out the security log one more time. You just looked at your clock. How am I doing? Am I okay? It's okay. I was going to say, because Dorothy ain't dead yet. <laughs> okay. No, we're doing fine. I just don't want to kill Dorothy. It'd be kind of bad. All right. I'm going to, I went ahead and entered the session. Now, mind you, I did it as Timmy, but I did it under the account that actually uses the domain admin account. So here we, whoops. Let me get to the right command here. All right. Let's take a look at what happened. We got a few more event entries in here. Let's see. Oh, look, there's Timmy. It still recorded Timmy using it. Now, if you go up a little bit, you will see the HDRA account was also used. But nonetheless, not perfect, but we still see the individual who used that particular endpoint. So we still have some ability to find out who just did what. But remember, Timmy was only able to do what we told him to do. So perfect solution? Nah, you're never going to find a perfect solution to security. Everybody's at the keynote yesterday, right? That little cat and mouse game? I was wondering when it was going to end. It doesn't end in this particular world. So yeah, this is, you know, breach of security, um, excuse me, excessive security rights. That's a huge issue, particularly in an organization that has not actually had formal IT management before. I've inherited those. Anybody inherit those? Mom and pop shop became successful and they need IT. Everybody's a domain admin, aren't they? Yeah, I've inherited places where every user was a local admin. Anybody have one of those? How was your tech support bill? Take it away. They complain, you have to give it back. So now you're paying excessive money. But still, a lot of problems are caused by excessive rights. That's something that we at least can take in control to some degree. I understand that the planning of this is going to be very difficult because especially you know, with GIA, you still have to take a look. What do people need? What endpoints do I need to deploy? What rights do you need? We're not going to get through over that particular procedure. There's no magic bullet here. You still need to take the time to do the research. What I found is if you work with people's managers and get them to do what's called buy-in. Everybody understand buy-in? That's when the manager is going to back you up because you know who's going to complain, right? The end user or whoever's, whoever's trying to use these endpoints, make sure that the management gives you their backing. So when you do launch this, if it is for a, let's call them a power user who does need to talk to another machine, and all of a sudden they can't reformat the hard drives, you've got some backing, right? It does take a lot of planning. Now, the thing to remember here is if we deploy these and then decide we need to bring them back and then redeploy them with different rights, uh, you'll probably have to restart the uh, WinRM service on those remote machines, which means any connection you have will break. You'll have to reestablish your connections. So it can be done. There's only a couple little hiccups involved. Putting them out is fast. Bringing them back in and then redeploying, yeah, you're, it's going to take a few extra seconds to do. All right? So, guys, that's my little presentation on how you can deploy these constrained endpoints out to remote service. This is actually something I do in my advanced PowerShell classes. We don't do it in the basic ones because, well, that's just a little bit too much information for people. But I hope you guys found this to be at least somewhat helpful. Do you guys have any uh, questions for me? Fire away. We'll start here. Could you lose, yeah, if you had local admin accounts out there um, and Timmy was a member of that local admin. Remember, I use domain because that's, if we had it local, I don't believe I could have registered the endpoint. But if you want to try afterwards here, I got a few minutes. We can go outside and we can quickly give that a try and see what happens, okay? All right, so hang tight, all right? We had a question over here? Yes, go ahead. Okay. Well, you two fight, decide who's going to ask. Okay, go ahead. Yeah, okay. okay, the links. So is there some way to link these two together? Let's see. Log on good. Let's see. A76. Nope, that doesn't work. The log on ID. Let's see. 
Let's see, 7D1. Nope, they don't correlate in any way. The time stamp, yeah. Yeah. Hopefully they're not all trying to connect at the same time. I said, not perfect, but at least we have a recording. All right, go ahead. What's your question? I have not tried it with group managed service accounts. That would be a fun one we can try as well. All right, anybody know what a group service, a group managed service account? That's when nobody knows the password. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because we do have to authenticate as of that is the one issue. So, again, we can look it up and see if there's a way we can do that. I know I love that service, the group managed service accounts. When I left an organization, we didn't have group service managed. So I gave the person in charge, the director, all the service accounts, all the usernames and passwords, where they're at, and changed the passwords. Because I'm not supposed to know them right afterwards, right? That was on Friday. On Monday, I'm at my new job. He calls, hey, I need you to come back in. Why? Well, I deleted all the service accounts like he told me to. <laughs> I'm a consultant now. Let's talk. <laughs> Next question, please. As you guys can tell, I've had a fun career, huh? All right. Well... Guys, a few things. Remember, set up your, your profile endpoint to capture that SDDL string. That's the key because that reduces the typo. We don't have tab completion to do this, guys. Sorry. All right, next up, remember to remove it when you're done or make it on the virtual machine you just take down. That way you don't leave that, that, endpoint, that vulnerability up there. Practice that principle of least privilege at all times. We do not want people to have more access rights. We do, however, want them to be able to do their job. All right. And also, guys, for those of you more interested in GIA, um, yep, uh, Brad Sher, uh, he, we're actually doing a session tomorrow. Well, tomorrow he's also doing one on GIA. I suggest you guys attend that one. But if you can't, um, at uh, Microsoft Ignite, both in Chicago and Australia, um, Oren Thomas, he actually did a video. It's posted up at Channel 9. It shows you some really neat stuff about GIA if you're interested in going to that particular level. All right, so before we take a quick break, i got to do the final thing here. Uh, if anybody's interested, I do have a blog that I have not tended to this year because I have been absolutely swamped with work this year. But a lot of the stuff I've been working on, a lot of these projects are about to end up on that blog. That's my Twitter handle. Anytime the blog updates, that gets lit up. If anybody's interested, again, I am a Microsoft trainer. I do a lot of different PowerShell classes. Give me a call or contact your local tra Microsoft Training Center and ask them to give me a call, and I'll be happy to help you or your staff get through PowerShell and finally learn it. Also, one of our sponsors here, O'Reilly Media, guess what? I have a video training series with them for advanced PowerShell scripting. Just go to their website, type that in, it'll take you right to it. Does anybody have their own little sandbox or do not have their own little sandbox to play in? Because I put the code in the free section to build one. Okay, they, now when we deployed this, it was still called, what was, what was Windows Server 2016 before they called it 2016? Windows Server 8, Windows 8 Server, something like that. I don't know. It's still labeled as that. I told them to change it. They haven't. But anyhow. All right. And also, for those of you who would like all the code I just showed you today, hey, guess what this is? This is my OneDrive. Download it. Use it. Have fun with it. Cool? All right, everybody, thank you very much. I appreciate your time. Enjoy the rest of your time at the conference. Oh, hey, one more thing. One more quick thing. I promised these guys I'd mention this. We're doing a lot of this again in Singapore in about five months in October. Let me tell you about Singapore. You get to the site a lot faster than you do here. All right, this site, by the way, is wonderful. But guess what? You also don't go hungry in Singapore. Oh, they got fancy restaurants like Long John Silver's, Burger King, McDonald's. You cannot go hungry in Singapore. But anyhow, guys, we hope to see you all there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andrew. No, thank you. I appreciate your help. All right.